Um, one thing before I get down to my talk, it's about Victor's talk. Uh, some of the things he, all of the things he talked about essentially are questions, open problems, etc. are actually in a paper which is available. So if anyone wants to look at some of them. So I wanted to uh, say that. Um, and then the next thing is, well, I am grateful to <laughs> both Victor and uh, Mark because they mentioned, they talked, to, Victor mentioned pseudo rotations and all that. Um, Mark reminded us quantum homology, so this is all good. And um, they will come uh, into play in this talk. So let me first say that this is joint work with Arman Chinedi. and Victor Ginsburg. Okay. So, and uh, the upshot is going to be that it, uh, I'm going to try to illustrate to you um, for certain class of maps to the rotations uh, under some conditions, uh, uh, the, Gromo the, the manifold having these things must have non vanishing Gromovitan invariants. Or, I mean, even quantum product is deformed. Okay, so, but let me start with some uh, background story where this story is coming from. So, the setting is, of course, we have a symplectic manifold closed. Um, and a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Okay. So as Victor reminded us, so we are looking for, first of all, periodic uh, orbits of phi or periodic points of phi, simple periodic orbits. And as Victor reminded us, uh, call me conjecture, Uh, states that for all phi, the number of simple periodic orbits is infinite. Okay, so this is the count of simple orbits. Now, this conjecture holds uh, for, major, for majority of symplectic manifolds. So we know that it holds for symplectically aspherical manifolds uh, through works of various people. Um, and then we know that it works in the color BR case, in the color BR case, it holds for um, negative monotone symplectic manifolds. And at the same time, um, we know that it <laughs> miserably fails in the very simple uh, situations. Uh, our favorite example of an irrational rotation of the sphere. Here is our S2 by an angle, uh, say, uh, by an irrational angle. We know that this map has to periodic orbits, these are also the fixed points, and it doesn't have any other periodic orbits. And um, in fact, uh, the state of the art concerning this uh, situation is the following result dating 2015. Is the, so this is um, due to Victor and myself. So the result states that, so it basically gives you a topological criterion. It says that if the Colney conjecture fails, which means that the, the manifold admits a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with finitely many simple periodic orbits, uh, then there must be a sphere uh, with the property that it evaluates positively over the symplectic form and the first turn of the tangent bundle. So um, that's 
write it this way. So this is as close as, I mean, this is basically the uh, state of the art. And it gives us this uh, nice, you may call topological criteria. Okay, so now let's go back to, however, in a situation where phony conjecture fails and look at which manifolds really, uh, for which manifolds this really happens. And we immediately observe that this happens actually uh, for complex projective spaces, grass minions. Um, Anytime the manifold admits Hamiltonian tor torus action or circle action with uh, isolated fixed points. Uh, so this is the class of manifolds we are talking about. And a common feature of them is that these manifolds are syntactically rich, basically. So it's natural to ask whether we can actually find the characterization of this situation, uh, you know, uh, in the language of symplectic topology. So what can we say is can we find a symplectic uh, criterion for this? And this is where the so-called chance MacDuff conjecture comes into play. And it says the following thing. Let's write it. So if the colony conjecture fails for uh, M, for a given symplectic manifold M, then there must be some non-zero Gromov-Wittling invariance, even the quantum product is deformed. So um, I'll just write it this way. Okay. hard, basically. Uh, this is hard because you see, I mean, you want to just start with any manifold. And all you assume is that you have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with finitely many periodic orbits. And you want to say something pretty strong, actually, from a symplectic topological perspective. So, uh, so, right, so we want to go from dynamics to topology, symplectic topology. So maybe the general thing is here. And this is hard. We don't have any seriously you know, developed methods doing this. Of course, in the opposite direction, uh, again, the, in the 90s, uh, through the several works of Hofer, for instance, this direction is pretty well established direction in symplectic topology. So from topology, you're assuming something starting with manifolds with certain properties and then uh, proving existence of periodic orbits, for example. That's that. And till recently there was, uh, so this is, we would write it this way, and this is the difficulty in trying to deal with this kind of um, situation. And there were no results <laughs> till uh, very recently, except one result of MacDuff, uh, 2009, I want to say. This is the paper, I think it was titled Hamiltonian S1 manifolds are uniruled. So where she proves that uh, if, it is exactly what I said, uh, if you have a Hamiltonian uh, circle action, if a M admits a Hamiltonian circle action, then the manifold is uniroot. Okay, so you have these um, holomorphic curves through every point, and you have also non-zero Gromovitan invariance. Uh, this is, let, let's just think about this for a second. This is actually, um, at first glance, probably pretty easy to believe, right? Because you have this uh, circle action. Uh, you can take an invariant J, 
and then take an entire gradient trajectory, and then um, sort of apply the action to it, and you're going to get a sphere out of this. So you can actually see the spheres there. Of course, the difficulty isn't seeing the sphere, but it's actually showing that this will eventually correspond to uh, non-zero Gromov written invariance, so in this work. Now, I just want to say that if we just go back to this picture, in general, of course, just let's remove this circle action from the picture, you don't even see the spheres. You, you don't see anything, basically. Okay, so uh, this is kind of the situation. And so, as I said, this was the only result till recently. And uh, so now we have, uh, as of me, some uh, made uh, like two months ago, basically, we have two um, results about this conjecture. But before maybe uh, I get into them, I want to say the following thing. So what we want to do, as I said, it by itself is, uh, doesn't seem terribly <laughs> tractable. So one class of maps, it happens to be a more tractable question, is to focus on pseudo-rotations rather than looking at any kind of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with finitely many periodic orbits. Okay? So let's focus on pseudo-rotations. So. Um, how do I want to think about pseudo rotation? So again, uh, it was good that <laughs> Victor reminded us what pseudo rotations are. Uh, in general, the way we, I want to think about it, and I think you should think about pseudo rotations as uh, these are Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with finitely many periodic orbits. All periodic orbits are fixed points. And the number of them is the minimum possible number, basically. Uh, this is all good, but of course, I mean, I mean, for CPN, this number is n plus 1, again, as Victor mentioned in his talk. Now, uh, in general, this minimum number should be somehow given to us by Arnold conjecture, the situation where it applies, etc. For this talk, however, uh, I am going to actually go a little bit more general than the Victor situation, and I'm going to define it in the following way. Um, let me just say the following so that I don't repeat. The manifolds that I'm going to uh, be working with just assume that they are at least weakly monotone, so that all the flare, quantum, all this technology works. Okay? All the machinery. Okay, so you fix a ground ring. Uh, F and the way I want to define it is that uh, V is, let me just first say that for all so let's call V a pseudo rotation if Uh, for all iterations p to the k, the flare differential is zero. Okay. Now, I'm going to, in fact, uh, that's exactly what happens when you have, like, when you take this situation, what happens to what the pseudo rotations are for CPN and etc. That's exactly what it is. So the differential is zero. Uh, I'm going to further make one more assumption, which again was not in Victor's talk, and I will assume that it is actually strongly non-degenerate. In the sense that all of these iterations are non-degenerate. This, uh, probably one can remove this assumption, but with this things are just infinitely easier to state and uh, sort of easier to prove as well. Um, okay, so now uh, this, the first one is, uh, as I said, it, the, the exact definition of the differential may depend on your almost complex structure, but this is a well-defined condition. 
Um, and another thing is that when you have a pseudo rotation phi, its iterations are also pseudo rotations. Um, now, all non pseudo rotations actually share, uh, <laughs> let me also say the following thing, share a common feature. And this common feature is actually, share many common features, and one of them is that they are actually all strongly non degenerate. So it seem, may seem like a restriction, but in reality, we don't have any example where this is not the case. Um, and then their all orbits are uh, periodic, all dimensional homology is zero, et cetera. So they, they are like really sort of uh, pretty nice situation there. Okay? So one example is one can write explicit example, which I do not want to do in this talk because I don't want to assume my manifold is anything other than weakly, man, uh, weakly monotone. So for a strongly non-degenerate Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, if you happen to have that all periodic orbits are elliptic, actually, then this is a pseudo rotation. So maybe I'll just write it this way. Okay. Uh, as I said, all of the examples we know are of this type. And then another example is what we call true rotations. Uh, and this is the case if phi generates, if you take the power of it and its uh, closure in ham, phi generates a compact subgroup of uh, ham. Okay. Again, these really do correspond to, the, the, one could say more, but maybe I'm not going to say more, uh, more about this. All these things motivates from like what we would call a rotation uh, for say CPI, obviously, for example. Okay, uh, and then actually, I also again need to assume that this is strongly non-degenerate then it is a pseudo rotation and all non pseudo rotations are actually of this type or they're obtained by a conjugation method was known as conjugation method from true rotations basically again victor quoted works of anasov katok um, for pseudo rotations with non trivial dynamics as well as in higher dimensions works of uh, work in progress of uh, uh, leroux and seyfardini Okay, so uh, there is, of course, a rich story here uh, in low dimensions, etc. Maybe I'm going to skip all of this uh, for the time being. So this is the class of maps that we will want to focus on. Um, okay, so now let me tell you what the results are. Of course, at the moment, I'm only going to be able to tell you like what they say uh, roughly. So, okay. So the main result of this, our work with uh, Erman and Victor is the following uh, thing. So uh, it's a new preprint from me. Uh, I'll just write CGG here. And the result is that, as I said, the manifold is at least weakly monotone. I need to assume that Minimal churn is at least one. Uh, and that it admits a pseudo rotation, otherwise, there is nothing to talk about. Let's call it phi. 
Now, in addition to this, for the time being, a black box. And the box is like some conditions on phi or the, rather its linearization at, uh, at some fixed point. So I'll write it this way. Uh, some extra conditions here. So let's write it like this. And the uh, statement is that the quantum product is deformed. Quantum by which I mean that um, you know, you have the classical cup product plus the correction terms. There is at least one non-zero correction term. Okay, so it is different from the, the cup product. In particular, out of this, you get, of course, non-zero uh, non, non Gromovitin invariants. Now, before I get into uh, uh, talk giving, t telling you the, a bit of the ingredients of this theorem, and which will immediately require me to get into what's in this box. Um, there is a related work which also came out in uh, May, and this is uh, Shiluki. I mean, related in the sense of concerning the same question of a similar question, let's put it this way. Um, and the result, uh, Igor's result, is the following thing. So just so that you can <laughs> have a sense of what's going on here, he assumes that the manifold is monotone uh, and has the so-called Poincare duality property. Okay, which means that uh, I believe it also came up in Victor's talk in defining the gamma norm. Uh, this, the action selector, the spectral immediate corresponding to the point class is negative of the one corresponding to the fundamental class for the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism generating the inverse flow, basically. Um, with this property, again, of course, uh, M admits a PR. Okay. So Igor proves that a uh, quantum Steenrod square is deformed. Okay. So as far as I know, uh, this property holds uh, when n is at least m plus 1. And all of this is combined, as far as I know, again, CPN is the only example which this, this result applies, basically. Uh, and again, as far as I understand, this not necessarily implies that, not, uh, that you have a non-emission gram of it in the merit in the picture. So these two things. Also, as far as the methods goes, these two are very different sort of <laughs> stories, basically, this result and this result. So pretty, I just wanted to sort of bring this comparison. Both uh, are May 19. Okay. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. What do you mean? These extra conditions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, yes. In the sense that um, not all of them will satisfy. I just want to say. So it's not like. Uh, Correct me, Victor, if I'm a So if you take a true rotation, are the conditions satisfied all the time? No, this is not true. So there are, 
No, no, as one action is one, you, you don't know. Yeah, let's uh, maybe talk about it later. So, so the, the thing I want to say, just the second, Mark, let me say, and then maybe you ask, and then. Yeah, yeah, they're going to get strong in the sense of what? Too restrictive, is it what you mean, or too? I mean, can you write down sort of I will write down. Write yeah, down yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The, the, the reason, yeah, the, I was just about to say that. The reason I didn't start saying them, because it, it requires some language. But once you get into it, it actually turns out that, the way I put it, you have to get out of your way to create this pseudo rotation, which is not going to have one fixed point, which is not going to hold, for which these properties are not going like to like hold. Basically, expect it to be satisfied by more majority of pseudo okay. rotations. These are the distance. It's just not easy to state one line, right? Uh, yeah. So pretty much the rest of the talk is going to be about, we're going to talk about this, it's basically what, I'm, what I am trying to say here. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so I had this plan and uh, all right. So what is going on? So what I wanted to do, actually, Is show you what how this thing works in an example, maybe where these things come from. So let's look at one example. Okay. So and this example is going to be let's take a t let's take the sphere, v an irrational rotation of the sphere, and I want the angle. Uh, theta to be, uh, the, I want it to be a long rotation of this angle. So we have the fixed points north pole and the south pole. Let me call this x, call this y. I want to equip them with um, trivial capping. And with my conventions, and maybe I should write it here, remember I have a pseudo rotation uh, and so I have uh, this is equal to for all iter iterations is equal to that. And this is isomorphic to the quantum homology. And I want the degree shifted by n. Okay? So the, this is going to be the case. So again, with trivial cappings, this has index negative 1. This is index one, again, with my, uh, my uh, convention. So we have this counterclockwise rotation here, clockwise rotation here. And this will be the uh, coming from the uh, point class. And this will be corresponding to the fundamental class. There is a unique correspondence between the quantum homology classes and kept periodic orbits here. OK, so. So x represents the point class, and y represents the fundamental class here. OK, so what else do we know? Let's iterate this picture. When we iterate this picture, I want to look at the second iteration of the orbit x. and. Because this is a long rotation, there will be a jump in the index by 2. And with this uh, sort of orientation convention, this is going to be negative 3. Okay? So then, because of this unique correspondence, this orbit is going to represent um, qs2. What is my q? q is the generator of the Novikov ring. write it this way, and with my conventions, it is of degree twice the minimal charm. So for this example, this is a minus 4 degree uh, term we have here. And in 
quantum world, the degree of this is negative two. When you do the shift, it is minus three, basically. Okay, so x squared represents q times minus x squared. Now I want to look at a special kind of pair of pants. The pair of pants curve are going to come from um, x, x. to x squared, okay, literally. Uh, they, they will have zero energy, so the difference between the uh, action of this, some of the actions of this and the actions of this. And dimension of the um, corresponding moduli space here is going to be also zero because of these indices, okay? And in this case, it's standard that this curve is regular. So we're going to see this x squared showing up in the, uh, in the quantum or the pair of pants curve. So x, x is going to be x squared. Actually, there's nothing here, but possibly if you had something, they would all have lower action. But in reality, there is exactly one curve connecting these two uh, things, okay? So there will be no cancellation whatsoever here. And now if I carry this to the quantum world, what I get is that point plus, point plus corresponds to this term, maybe plus some other, okay, but then again, no cancellation. So I get this now as you think. On the other hand, if the product, quantum product were not deformed, I would have to have that this is zero, basically, in this picture. So now the, what we want to do is we want to take this picture and somehow generalize it. So how I can sort of get, use a similar idea here. So this is uh, sort of the key, uh, key example here. So let's go here. So to this end, so as you might have uh, by now understood, there will not be like any specific sort of finding room of it in invariance business. It will come from a very special kind of pair of pants curves, basically. And then through this isomorphism, we'll get this nomination room of it in invariance. Okay, so what we want to do, I want to look at the following kind of uh, curves. So I will have, uh, the same orbit x, and then I want to put iterations of an orbit x, maybe kr here, and then I will look at these guys. Here I'm going to have the kth iteration of this orbit, and k is going to be uh, the sum of ki's like that. Again, the energy which will be given by the action difference is going to be zero for these things. So I'm going to be looking at zero energy uh, pair of pants curves, but this very specific type of pair of pants curves. Okay. All right, so now um, And then what I want is the following kind of uh, situation out of this picture. I want to have that when I do this product somehow, I will have this term here and possibly some lower action terms, but I want to see this uh, picture again. And once more, the regularity here is going to hold if I look at the zero dimensional moduli spaces pretty, again, standard thing here. And if you look at the dimension of that moduli space, it's going to be exactly the following, uh, or the Fredholm index. So I'll write it this way, the moduli space of such solutions with zero energy. Um, remember, everything is uh, non-degenerate here, x to the k. 
And then I'm going to have this star. Okay, so I want to make sure that this is equal to zero, basically. So these are the kind of curves that I want to look at. Okay, um, very good. So, so let's now, it brings us to the next uh, question. And maybe even before the next question, uh, there is sort of one more thing I need to make sure here. And what I need to make sure here is that in order to be able to say that, so this is going to, if I did this, this would give me some non-vanishing product in quantum homology, yet I wouldn't be able to say just by this uh, that I'm not getting a trivial product in the sense of powers of the fundamental class by itself. So I also need to make sure some index condition. This is one way to ensure that. And this would be that um, uh, if you look at the uh, indices of these guys, I want to say that uh, mod in mod 2 So in quantum world, this will be of degree 2n, which is the degree of the fundamental class, basically. So also need this. This kind of situation. OK, so this brings us to following uh, the following kind of notion. And this notion is the notion of extreme of partitions. So, So which is basically going to turn this question into a combinatorics kind of question. So okay. What's an extremal partition? So this is all again at the end of the day for our pseudo rotation, we'll be looking for one fixed point whose linear, linearization satisfies certain properties, if you wish, or the um, uh, end point of that. So this is about, actually, symplectic linear algebra at this stage. So I can just focus on a, P, uh, a path. So let me assume that uh, this is elliptic. In fact, it will follow from what I'm going to ask it to do. And I'm also assuming, as is the case in my scenario, this is non-degenerate, strongly non-degenerate in this strong sense. So by which I mean that if I look at the iterations of the end point, this is non-degenerate. It's just a standard. Okay, so extremal partition definition, uh, an unordered partition, k1, kn is equal to k in n, ki's are all natural numbers, uh, of, so I'll call this a length r external partition if, and this will be, of course, with respect to whatever symplectic <laughs> map you have, if the following thing is true, so it's going to make this thing zero. So I want to look at the sum minus this, OK? OK, so why is it extremal? So 
Uh, a result going, so why is it called extremal? A result going back to MN uh, S. This isn't hard to prove, but I will. And Piccione says the following thing. If you take two non-degenerate symplectic uh, paths, then if you look at this uh, difference, the, the sum and the difference, I compose them, this is less or equal to n. It, of course, immediately implies that if you know both of these guys, uh, all of these guys are non-degenerate, right? And then you're going to have the following property, basically. Now, let us call this, if you wish, this to be the defect of this conventional quasi-morphism, whatever you call it. Now, extremal is exactly that this is equal to, uh, basically, the right-hand side. What we have, of course, for us, the motivation is this. Um, all right. So extremal partitions are the partitions that maximize the defect. And I want to emphasize that the defect here uh, actually only depends on the endpoints. Basically, if you have it loops, et cetera, it's going to sort of cancel out in this, in this process. OK, what are some examples of extremal partitions? For instance, if you just so that you, of course, they are uh, <laughs> everywhere. So if you look at. A direct sum of counterclockwise rotations in a small angle. I'll write it this way. Okay. Lambda i a positive t in here. Okay, I want this to be small. So for as long as um, r times the maximum of lambda i is less than 1, then uh, 1 plus 1 equal to r is an extremal partition. Let's call it EP. It will be an extremal partition of length r for this, right? Uh, because of this condition, you will uh, look at the r iteration of this thing. It will have index n. This thing is also index n, and you look at the difference, it's exactly r minus 1 equals n. Likewise, if you take some of counterclockwise, sorry, clockwise rotations this time, you may need to iterate your map, but this will also be, uh, give you, you will also have for such thing extremal partitions. And then, um, right, in certain situations, okay, Maybe here's a scenario where they don't exist. If you took, instead of uh, same rotation, if you took the sum of one counterclockwise, one clockwise in the opposite directions, such a thing won't have an extremal partition because the index will always be zero, basically. Now, another thing maybe it's worth emphasizing here is that this immediately, remember this elliptic condition, this condition immediately also tells us that uh, if you have any hyperbolic part here, you would have defect here. You wouldn't have anything here. So which means that existence of uh, an extremal partition actually forces the, the, the map to be elliptic. So sometimes, so it maybe makes sense so, to say it. So ellipticity is a part of, uh, part of this thing. Okay, so now we have this combinatorial <laughs> thinking that we want these things to uh, exist, basically, for our uh, thing, because what they do is they deliver the non-vanishing products in quantum homology, basically. Um, all right, so let me try to go back. Uh, OK. Um, so, uh, one of the conditions, so let me just say a few words, is the existence of an extremal partition, for example. So that phi has a fixed point, uh, which will necessarily be elliptic, 
whose linearization will have an extremal partition, basically. But then again, you have to, uh, you know, um, you have to sort of have, give, one needs to give like a characterization of extremal partitions, et cetera, so that you can prove something, you can uh, calculate something. Uh, one of the sort of, uh, okay, I don't think I can probably say anything else without uh, telling you a bit more about, uh, more about the uh, language here. Okay, so uh, more ingredients. Um, that we need. All right, so let's. So after all, there is this index requirement that we also need to meet and all that. Uh, but we also need to give a characterization of these partitions and things to be able to prove anything. Okay, so now. Next ingredient is what we call the base group. Okay. Um, okay, so the base group is the following uh, not very tractable <laughs> by itself object. So um, let me take again elliptic, uh, symplectic map. And I want to assume that it is uh, semi-simple. In general, you don't need, this is important, but in general, you don't need to assume that. You can just uh, get an isospectral deformation of what you started with, because everything depends on the endpoint. And what I'm going to define doesn't depend on, this de on the deformation, so everything works out. But for simplicity, let's just assume that, okay? So then we actually think of, uh, uh, basically this is going to be diagonalizable over, um, over C, so we will have this N invariant subspaces of R to N. On each one of them, the map will be conjugate to a rotation, okay? Um, and then for this, uh, complex conjugate eigenvalues in each place, I'm going to take uh, the first grind type, whatever that is, uh, it just to reduce the dimension, basically. And so, uh, so maybe not even write it. Uh, so out of this, uh, I will have a collection of eigenvalues Okay, this will live in T n. Okay, um, so this is the collection of this kind of type. Okay, um, and then look at the group generated by this. I can define it as just like that. When P happens to be the linearization of my flow over a fixed point or a kept fixed point, I can also call this gamma gamma of x for a fixed point, basically. Okay? So this is, by definition, the subgroup of torus generated by these theta. So I look at k theta and take the closure of this. Okay? By the non-degeneracy condition, I know that this is at most, well, at least one dimensional, and it is of course at most n dimensional. By the semi-simple assumption, it will be a compact subgroup, or it won't necessarily be connected, however. So it's a, it's a messy, messy object, but in certain situations, it's easy to understand. Uh, you could also alternatively look at what this generates in uh, SP2N, basically. This is also another way to look at it. It's all the same thing. Okay, so, okay, so now uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at an example maybe. Uh, let's call a phi toric. 
if you wish, if um, this group happens to be the entire thing. So dimension of gamma is equal to n, basically, this kind of situation. Why I want to call it toric? Because if I had like a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism coming from a toric action, a torus action, if you look at, so then you know that uh, all orbits are elliptic, etc. You look at the linearization and it's going to have exactly this property that this group corresponding to that will always be n-dimensional, basically. So that's what the situation is. And for this kind of uh, sort of uh, toric sort of, let's call it toric pseudo-rotations or toric symplectic maps, if we want to stick to linear algebra, then what we have is that uh, for every r, there exists an extreme of partition of length r with exactly the index, index condition that I wanted. Okay, this quote. I think in this case it is. What I'm trying to say, I'm jumping ahead actually. What I wrote is correct, but more is correct in the toric case. You can really tell what these are. Uh, I think my condition was that this is not congruent to n, basically. So, um, okay. If I'm forgetting somewhere, you can always assume that the minimal churn is greater than one. So this, of course, immediately uh, translates into uh, the following quantum homological statement because I have these partitions for every R, so I can have arbitrary large length extreme partitions in the toric case. In particular, uh, one can say a corollary of this. Uh, if your M admits a toric PR, minimal churn is greater than one, then for every R greater than one, again, this is uh, I'm giving you now a very precise statement here, uh, much more than the black box, uh, with the property that if you take the art power of this, this is not equal to zero. This in particular proves that the quantum product is deformed because you can R, uh, take R as big as you want. And you know that you have a non-trivial product because of this. Okay, um, now that I have this gamma, I can tell you one more thing. I mean, I can tell you many things, but obviously I don't have time. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the conditions that gives us extreme partition is the following uh, geometrical condition. It's actually geometrical. So the essence of having these partitions or uh, making this machinery work is that what you want is to have one fixed point of your pseudo rotation whose corresponding base group defined in this way should be sufficiently dense in this torus, basically. So the way maybe one can formulate this is that uh, if, um, so I'll just write it this way. If you take this base group and if I look at this open cube, in the torus, remember this also lives in Pn, I need to have that this is non-empty. Uh, this implies that there exist extreme partitions of length R, for example. Okay, so you really need this gamma to be sufficiently dense. And um, it's an if and only if condition in, say, uh, in dimension four. So you can really characterize them. And what happens in dimension four, actually, is that all you have to do is exclude, sort of depending on what your minimal churn number is. Uh, minimal churn number, by the way, I didn't say this, but here's the theorem independently, Shilukin and us. Uh, if M admits a PR, 
minimal churn can be at most 2n. So in dimension 4, you really know that it can be 1, 2, or 3. 1 is excluded uh, as our methods do not apply. In uh, corresponding to this being 2 or 3, you just have to exclude six possible types of uh, base groups beyond which uh, you will have everything you want, basically. So having this uh, extremal partitions is uh, one of the conditions. Now, there is another one that I did not tell you. So there was, if you remember, there was this index condition that needed to be satisfied to make sure that we not only have non-vanishing products in quantum homology, but we also make sure that they are not powers of the uh, uh, fundamental class, basically. So, this, we have two kinds of conditions for them. One of them, basically, is that um, you look at the restriction of the mass of class to this group, okay? And then what you want is to have a loop uh, such that so I'll, let me write this condition. So if existence of EPs is condition one, let's call it condition two, is that you want the restriction of the Maslow class. Uh, so there exists a loop in, we write it this way, loop in here, in this base group, uh, such that if I evaluate this here, I don't want minimal churn to divide this. Again, in the case of toric, all these things are satisfied. This is, you can just take the co coordinate circle and then this will be one and provide that the minimal churn is greater than one, you always have this uh, condition satisfied. So in the toric case, like it's, it's really everything works essentially beautifully. And there's one more condition we can formulate the index thing in, in a different way, uh, but maybe I don't want to kind of get into it. So, um, okay, so let's see. Let me just now um, write <laughs> uh, write maybe a sort of what this now, um, box thing turned into. Um, again, as I said, these conditions are not terribly easy to write or <laughs> grasp at first glance, maybe, but um, when you get into it, actually, you, you understand that it's actually, uh, in most cases, they should be satisfied, basically. So the main result now turns into the following thing. Uh, so you want the following uh, conditions. So you want, let's suppose that M admits this is the assumption in pseudo rotation phi with an elliptic fixed point. X. Um, such that for some R, this will be the length of our partition. Uh, it uh, admits so it admits meaning the base group corresponding to its linearization external partition of length R. There's a nicer way to say it, but I didn't, so. And what I wrote there is, for instance, is one way to state one version of the result, that this condition two, then there exist R elements, alpha one to alpha R in quantum homology, with the property that they give you 
non-vanishing product, and that when you look at the degree of them, uh, of even degree, of course, <laughs> Modulo minimal turn number for all i. In fact, in the result, one doesn't even have to assume that this n is a minimal turn number. By the way, in a, none of this is actually, I'm saying this, but this doesn't have to be minimal turn actually. If you can find one n with this property, you're good to go. But if you want to conclude something about deformation of quantum product, et cetera, then actually you assume that uh, you want these conditions to hold for the minimal churn number. Okay, so, so the corollary would be that, again, assuming n is the minimal churn, um, and r is at least n plus one, then the quantum product is deformed. Okay. Are there situations where we don't have extreme null partitions, etc.? As I said, yes. Are there examples where this method doesn't work, even though we know that um, actually zero energy uh, pair of pants curve correspond to give us the deformation in quantum product? Yes, you can take S2 cross S2, like the diagonal rotation in the same angle. You will not get a fixed point which, with these properties. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, this is such a symmetric example. So it's literally like there is every feeling that your pseudo rotation have to be very, very symmetric so that it won't have one fixed point uh, for which these things won't be satisfied. So this is pretty much, I would say, take home about. Like these conditions are there, but for most uh, pseudo rotations, you would expect them to be satisfied. And uh, of course, one would like to remove them, nonetheless. Okay, I'll stop here, maybe, and answer questions if you have.